Hi, welcome back. This is our second video in our FLIP series for the cognitive approach and it's all around the multi-store model of memory. This is our oldest attempt to explain how memory works and it's based on the idea that we have different places in our brain, different stores where we put memories and the efficacy of memory is dependent upon which store they are placed in. Just a reminder that this comes from the cognitive approach. The cognitive approach emphasizes the internal processes of the mind and sees the brain as a computer processing information. A model is an attempt to understand how this happens. The highlighted pieces on this refer to your checklist and it shows you where you can tick off after you've watched this video. I'd just like to re-emphasize that in this case a model is a theoretical model. It's a way of conceptualizing difficult processes and ideas. We have to look at how helpful the model is. Does it oversimplify or is it useful at a starting point? So here is Atkinson and Schifrin's multi-store model. This was developed in 1968. To our eyes now, it looks rather simplistic, but as a starting point, it's been very useful. So you can see that we've got three stores. Each of those stores is what we call unitary. That means it can't be subdivided. It's one store, whole and in of itself. This is a serious weakness to this model, as we shall see later. However, let's look at how this model may work with an example. Say, for example, you meet somebody in a nightclub and you want to remember their telephone number. First of all, you pay attention while they're telling it you. You then keep it in your short-term memory while you rush off to the loos so you can put it in your phone. To keep it in your short-term memory, you're probably saying it to yourself over and over again. 637-872. 637-872. This is called maintenance rehearsal. Eventually, if you say it enough and you actually phone them, it will go into your long-term memory. At this point, if anybody asks you what Bob's phone number is, you can retrieve it from your long-term memory and tell them. When we compare the two memory stores, there are three types of characteristics that we usually look at. We look at encoding. Encoding refers to the type of memory trace. It could be sound, it could be vision, it could be feeling, it could be smell. Duration refers to how long the memory trace lasts. The idea of a short-term memory and a long-term memory might give you a bit of a clue. Capacity. This is how much information you can hold in your short-term memory or how much information you can hold into your long-term memory. Interestingly, difficulties in schooling and academic work are often associated with poor short-term working memory. So if we look at our short-term memory, if we look at encoding, it seems to be primarily phonetic, that is, how something sounds. But later on, there did come evidence of a separate store for vision, and some indication that every sense has its own separate store. This goes against what um, Atkinson and Schifrin suggested, because they suggested the stores were unitary. Duration. Duration in short-term memory is limited. Peterson and Peterson did an experiment in 1959 to show this. They showed that when you stop people rehearsing things in their short-term memory, remember saying those phone numbers over and over again, it stopped the, the information passing on to the long-term memory and they were unable to recall them. Have a look at their experiment. There's lots of information about it on the web. Capacity. 
George Miller suggested seven items, plus or minus two, not three as it says here. This is called Miller's Magic Number. It's very famous. However, in 2000, Cohen suggested that he was mistaken, and actually the um, capacity is limited to three or four items. He said that um, Miller could get seven or nine or eleven items because people were chunking. Chunking is when you put many things together to make one item. For instance, if I said to you, put the kettle on, you just think of one item, put the kettle on. You don't think of picking the kettle up, taking the lid off, putting it under the tap, turning the tap on, filling the kettle, putting the lid back on, returning it to its stand and switching it on. So all those things together are chunked together to make one item. If we look at long-term memory, this appears to be unlimited. You don't hear people say, well, I'd like to read that book, but I've run out of memory. The duration appears to be unlimited too. Evidence for this comes from the yearbook study done by Barak et al. They went to a high school reunion. It was 50 years since those people had, le had been at high school. And yet, when shown pictures from their yearbook, they could match the names to those pictures. So those memories, although unused largely, so think about the role of rehearsal, um, were still established and active enough to use after 50 years. Encoding in the long-term memory seems to be mainly about meaning. We call it semantic encoding. Badley, in 1966, showed that long-term memories of words that were similar in meaning were recalled worse than words similar in sound and appearance. In other words, meaning had an interference effect in the long-term memory. This indicates that the main form of encoding in the long-term memory is meaning. Back to et al. This is short for et alle. It's Latin and it means and everybody else. So, Baric et al. means Baric and everyone else who wrote this. Because it's Latin, we put it in um, italics, and because it's an abbreviation, we put a full stop after it. If you're asked to compare short-term memory and long-term memory, if you look at those three characteristics, that would be worth about six marks, because you could do a sentence on each one. If it's a bigger essay, you can include the research evidence as the elaboration. So back to the model. As I said before, this was a very simplistic model when we look back on it. But as a jumping off point, a start, it seems very useful. One of the problems is that it's rather linear. It all seems to be a bit one way, where we think of memories probably being a bit more interactive with each other. Let's look at some of the things that are good about the model. In exam speak, this is AO2, Assessment Objective 2. You need to know positive and negative evaluations about each of the studies we do. One of the good things about the multistore model is that the idea that there's separate short-term and long-term memory stores seems to be generally supported. Clive Waring supports it. His short-term memory is not working. He can't add new models to his long-term memory, but he can remember previous things that he's already stored. PET scans have also shown that different areas of the brain light up for the short-term memory and the long-term memory. The short-term memory tends to light up the free prefrontal cortex. The long-term memory tends to light up the hippocampus in the temporal lobes. Murdoch and Glazer and Kunintz found primacy and recency effects when learning new material. That is, things that were learned first were recalled better, and things that were learned last were recalled better, and things in the middle were recalled worst. This is one of the reasons we suggest you break up your revision into chunks. 
How does this support the idea of two separate stores? Well, they, are, they suggested that the primacy effect was because the material that had been learnt first had had a chance to go into the long-term memory. The recency effect, things that have been learnt the last, was still in the short-term memory. But the things in the middle had neither a chance to go into the long-term memory and had been pushed out of the short-term memory by the things at the end. This is one of the strongest pieces of evidence for separate short-term and long-term memory. Bad things about the multi-store model. In exam terms, this is negative AO2. It is very simplistic. We did notice that the sensory, um, the sensory memory and the short-term memory can be divided into the phonological loop, which is about auditory information, and the visual spatial sketchpad, which is about vision. There could even be more stores. There could be a haptic sketch pad, which would be about touch. There could be um, a sketch pad about your position in space. There's certainly going to be an olfactory sketch pad because I'm so, you know, when I smell an orange, I feel like Christmas and I associate the smell with Christmas. Long term memory doesn't appear to be a unitary store either. Clive could remember his procedural skills, like using a knife and fork, reading music, playing the piano, but he couldn't remember episodic memories from earlier on in his life, from later on in his life. The other thing is that it seems to be overly reliant on the idea of separate stores. If there's one thing we've learnt about the brain in recent years, is that we use more of it than we think. That old myth about using 10% of the brain is plain wrong. Probably the most difficult thing for the multi-store model is the existence of flashbulb memories. These were this term was coined by Brown and Kulik in 1977. These are very specific memories. They're memories that are clear and remarkably distinct without rehearsal. For instance, the Twin Towers. I can remember the day and the time and exactly what I was doing when I first heard about it. I can remember the way the dust motes swirled in the sunshine as we were playing in orchestra. Now I did not rehearse that memory. Um, the, the pictures of the Twin Towers themselves coming down may well have been rehearsed several times by watching news footage, but the memory of actually being told, which is remarkably clear and distinct, is certainly not rehearsed. But the multi-store model says rehearsal is necessary. It's obviously wrong. Rehearsal's not necessary. Remember these from your taster days. We're going to have a bit of a test on them on our next lesson. So make sure you can remember what each level of data is. Try and look back in your booklet and look at the examples we had. So this is our menu for next lesson. I'm going to expect you to do a number of these things, although not all of them. You'll see that some of them are more complicated than others. Making summary cards, for instance, that's just recall. If we look at the levels of um, mental processes, then recall is quite low. But creating a collage, that's quite a high level. So I need you to think about a variety of things that you'd like to do in the next lesson. If you want to make a collage and you've got sequins and feathers and shiny things, bring them in. I've got glitter and paper and glue and buttons and some shiny card so we can make a really interesting collage. I hope this helps you understand the multi-store model and remember it's just one model of memory. For your exam you need to know two